Welcome to this episode of Season 5 of The Common Bridge, where policy and current events are discussed in a fiercely nonpartisan manner. The host, Richard Helpy, is a philanthropist, entrepreneur, and political analyst who has reached over 4 million listeners, viewers, and readers around the world. With our surging growth in audience and subscriptions, The Common Bridge continues to expand its reach. The show is available on the Substack website and the Substack app. Simply search for The Common Bridge. You can also find us on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. The Common Bridge draws guests and audiences from across the political spectrum, and we invite you to become a free or paid subscriber on your favorite medium. Hello, welcome to The Common Bridge. I'm your host, Rich Halpy, and we have our guest today from the University of Washington, Professor Greg Colburn. And he's more than just a professor when you hear about his background in just a minute. Uh, we are going to be talking about homelessness, and we're going to be covering a lot in his book, uh, Homelessness is a Housing Problem. And I recommend uh, that you buy this book, read this book, listen to this book, however you like to get your books. And if, especially if you're a data nerd like me, you're really going to like it and the, the thoroughness of it. But you think about homelessness in contrast to the American dream of a single family ownership with a yard, a sidewalk, a garage, and maybe even a garden. Um, today in America, 62% of housing units are owner occupied. Of the remaining 38% that are in rental status, most of those are with private landlords with just 7% subsidized through taxpayer-funded programs. So welcome, Greg Colburn, to the show of The Common Bridge. It's an honor to have you here. Uh, thanks, Rich. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. What you're going to hear today on The Common Bridge is uh, some popular misconceptions destroyed. Uh, you're going to hear about a well-researched policy solution. And so we're welcoming uh, Professor Colburn to The Common Bridge. Um, uh, Greg, you've got such a great background. We can't go into all of it uh, uh, beyond the honors and awards. Maybe a, a quick thumbnail on your biography. Where did you grow up? What was your undergraduate, graduate, your investor career? And then how did you end up at the University of Washington uh, teaching and researching? Uh, sure. Yeah, I'm a Midwesterner. I was uh, raised in, in Minnesota, just outside the Twin Cities, and um, went to undergrad in Michigan at Albion College. Uh, began a career at that point in um, in the finance space, I was an investment banker in New York with Goldman Sachs and moved to Chicago with Goldman and then worked in, in the private equity and, and buy side uh, arena for another uh, 13, 14 years um, and was about to turn 40 and, and had a long term uh, interest in being a professor. And so was getting to the point where it's like, well, if I'm going to make a change, I probably should do so sooner rather than later and ultimately ended up getting um getting my PhD in public policy and uh, with a focus on housing policy. And, uh, you know, at the conclusion of, of that degree program in, in 2017, was fortunate enough to um, to land a position with the University of Washington here in Seattle and and uh, have been thrilled to have this as my professional and academic home. And, and obviously, if you're interested in housing and homelessness, either it's either good or bad, depending on, on your perspective. But there's no shortage of things to study in Seattle, given given the housing challenges we have out here. Great. And your, your uh, master's degree is from Northwestern University. Yep. I got my MBA at Northwestern in, while I was in my uh, first career. That's right. Great. Well, it looks like you're not going to get far from the Big Ten, or actually the Big Ten's not going to get far from you. Yeah, that's right. I can't, get from the, can't get away from the Big Ten. It just keeps following me, which Indeed. I'm excited about. Uh, so just in setting the stage, um, how big a problem is homelessness? Well, um, you know, there's there's a couple different ways to measure homelessness. One of the challenges is homelessness is a little hard to to measure uh, because it's a population that is is difficult to count. Um, you know, the the public, the stated figure of homelessness in the United States is about 582,000 people on a single night, um, and that's based on a census that we do every January. Every jurisdiction does that. Most people agree that that's likely an undercount uh, because so many people experiencing unsheltered homelessness are difficult to find. And so we, we, we recognize that as kind of a floor estimate. In fact, it's probably higher. What that estimate also doesn't take into account that um, for a lot of people, homelessness tends to be a relatively episodic occurrence, meaning you're kind of in and then out. And so um, many scholars have said, well, what's the, what's the prevalence of homelessness over a year, for example? How many people experiencing 
experience homelessness within a year, not just on a given night. And once we start talking about those longer time periods, um, now we're talking about millions of people, not just hundreds of thousands. The other thing that's really important is um, the United States has a definition of homelessness that excludes a lot of people who are precariously housed. So for example, if I run into difficulty and Rich, you're kind enough to let me sleep on your couch for a month, per the federal definition, I am not homeless. Even though I'm without a residence, I'm, I'm only housed because of your generosity. Um, other nations around the world actually include doubled up, which is the term for, for that type of living arrangement, in their, uh, in their count of homelessness. And so there have been some estimates based on census data um, that there are multiples for every person who's experiencing homelessness, there are multiple people experiencing doubled up homelessness, which is not captured in the federal definition. So, um, it, you know, it is a significant phenomenon in the United States. It is nowhere near the poverty crisis where 12 to 15 percent of the population is below the federal poverty line. But we're talking about millions of people who are precariously housed. And so it's definitely um, either for for humanitarian reasons, social reasons, economic reasons worthy of our time and attention as a, as a nation, in my opinion, anyway. It, it, well, it's uh, I come from a background in healthcare information, and uh, we know there's a correlation between uh, housing instability and consumption of healthcare services. For sure. Um, people that, you know, are moving a lot uh, tend not to have great health status, um, and also in education. Um, you know, children trying to attend school uh, that don't have ho housing security or stability uh, aren't going to do um, as well. Um, you know, I know that uh, there's numbers of schools of thought uh, about and how you approached your study about is it an individual or is it, uh, you know, systemic? Um, one of the things you call out in your book that, you know, we've always had mental illness. We've always had poverty, substance abuse, but we didn't have the homelessness. Um so what's changed or, or why today are we experiencing this level of homelessness in a country as rich as the United States of America? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm going to just go do a quick history lesson here. I promise not to belabor this, but I think it you is. Can, you, it's, I, I, we would love, trust me, my audience loves getting this stuff. So okay. let us have it, please. So there have really been two major manifestations of homelessness over the last 150 years in the United States. The first one was during the Great Depression in, in the 1920s in the U.S., and, or excuse me, in the 1930s, began in 1929. And um, that, that episode of homelessness was, to a certain extent, somewhat intuitive. We had a massive economic shock, 25% unemployment, banks are, are failing, people's homes are being foreclosed on. And so what happened is we ended up with these villages or, or um, tent villages and cities called Hoovervilles. And it was named mm -hmm. after Hoover, Herbert Hoover, who was president um, when the depression started. And while tragic, everyone said, well, yes, you know, if, if we have this huge economic depression, it's, it seems to make intuitive sense that we have homelessness. We then go, uh, you know, we get out of the, the depression, we go to World War II, we end up with economic prosperity of the 50s and 60s, 70s are a little shaky. And we end up um, at the end of the 70s, at, you know, as we're transitioning from Carter to Reagan, you know, it's a tough time, gas prices are high, inflation is high, interest rates are high, we have a recession, it's not a depression, but it's a recession. And we start to see a little bit more homelessness. And what's fascinating is when you read accounts from that time, and this, this now moves into the early 80s, people are saying, well, when the econ economy bounces back, the homelessness will go away. And in fact, programming at that point was um, on homelessness was under FEMA, which is really a, a, you know, a disaster relief approach, meaning this is a temporary condition like a flood, like a hurricane, and therefore we're going to provide federal resources on a temporary basis. Well, as uh, well, not everyone, but if you remember that, you know, his, uh, the economics of history, 80s, we we end up with an economic boom in, you know, during Reagan's end of his first term and into the second term, the economy takes off, stock market takes off, employment takes off, and what happens? Homelessness is still sticking there, which caused a whole bunch of people to scratch their heads and say, well, what is going on here? And so this really starts the modern manifestation of homelessness, which um, unlike prior episodes where it was just single men on trains, hobos, skid row, all of a sudden we're seeing families and children and women and children and older adults and, and a broader population of people experiencing homelessness. And that caused a lot of people to say, hmm, what has fundamentally changed? And, and what has changed over the last 40 years is the relationship between income and housing costs has deviated, meaning 
housing costs have continued to go up while you know inflation adjusted uh, incomes for middle and lower income households have stagnated that has put a lot of pressure on on households and frankly federal support for low income households on housing has has stagnated or declined over that time period and so when you combine these forces with with an inadequate policy response we end up with a really uh, kind of difficult conundrum, which is huge wealth, uh, great economic advances over the last 40 years, while persistently high levels of homelessness. And that's really what it wanted, you know, prompted me to want to write this book is. Well, well the reason, and, and uh, I like the way you've, we've gone after the research and uh, I, I want to dig into that and um, <laughs> probably dispense some of the kind of headline reasons or the sure. major um, reasons that people see. Uh, but I recall that period, late 1970s, uh, early 1980s, and what was going on. This was when uh, the automotive industry, which was the underpinning of our economy, uh, was really starting to feel the, the first post-World War II effects of international competition. And there was a great dislocation of people leaving uh, my hometown of Detroit, Michigan, um, going to Houston, uh, Dallas, other Sunbelt places looking for work. Um, th there was actually a derogatory term called black taggers because the license plate of Michigan at that time was a, a black license plate. Um, and it kind of masked things, but it also was the beginning of the end of the era of a blue collar job making a, a home and a you know vacation and a boat maybe affordable. Yep. And, and we're, you know, f downstream uh, from from there. Um, and this is why I was fascinated with you're, you're not looking at the short, easy answers. So um, some of the things you dispel in your book with your research is how important is weather really? And I remember when I first came across you, you were quoted in the L.A. Times and you were comparing uh, the homelessness in Detroit and your and los angeles and my instinct was yeah it's easier to live outside in los angeles in february okay don't do that in michigan all right you won't last very long as a minnesotan i know you'll understand that absolutely but what did you discover how important really is i'll, I'll probably in case it's all one answer weather and local policy and um you know, water in mountains as it pertains to trying to get more supply on the market. When you think about this, what kind of conclusions did you reach? Well, I, you know, we we tackle a whole bunch of potential explanations. And the, the, the motivating question of the book is what explains regional variation in rates of homelessness? That's the question we ask. And and just to, to um, give a brief answer to that, uh, or to at least quantify that variation, because I think that's important for the answer on, on the weather front, which is we have coastal cities, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Boston, New York, Washington, DC, that have five times the per capita homelessness of Chicago, for example. And they're you know Indianapolis and St. Louis and Baltimore and Cleveland are, are in the same boat of Midwestern cities. So we have massive variation from the coast to some Midwestern cities. Why is that? And so we test a bunch of explanations to try to provide a, a credible answer to that question. One of them that I hear whenever I'm at a cocktail party and someone hears that I uh, study homelessness is, well, the weather is moderate on the West Coast, so of course we have lots of homelessness. And Greg, you, you in Chicago is cold in January, so uh, of course. And I'll say, well, um, that's, that's fine, but you're ignoring the fact that Boston and New York are very cold in January, and they have very, very high rates of homelessness. And you're ignoring the fact that Miami and Dallas and San Antonio and Phoenix and other southern cities, Charlotte, um, that are mild in January, don't have big problems with homelessness. And so certainly the LA Detroit comparison is convenient if you want to make a weather argument. But if you actually take a broader look at, at the nation, that argument doesn't hold, you know, doesn't hold up. Now, weather does play a role, and we talk about this in the book, in the policy response in the sense that um, home, total homelessness includes people in shelter and people who are on the streets. East Coast cities that are cold have constructed robust shelter systems and therefore house uh, a, a large percentage of the people experiencing homelessness in shelters. Um, West Coast cities, it's about a 50-50 mix. So um, conspicuous unsheltered homelessness that we see on the street is more prevalent on the West Coast. And there might be a weather story there. But LA doesn't have more homelessness because of weather. It's just we don't build shelter on the West Coast because 
you won't die in January like you would in Boston. Um, so weather is, is, is not to blame. The other argument is this mobility argument. We've created an environment which fosters or encourages people to move here and experience homelessness because of, of tremendous generosity. We find no evidence of that, and, and there's extensive literature demonstrating that this is not a mobility argument. People will come back and push back on me, and I'll say, is there an anecdote to the contrary? Sure, but we shouldn't make policy based on anecdote. Generally speaking, homelessness is a homegrown problem. The people experiencing homelessness in Seattle, San Francisco, and Los Angeles are from those communities. There is some mobility from suburbs to the urban core related to homelessness, but we don't see a lot of Topeka to Seattle type mobility um, around homelessness. Because generally speaking, these benefits that people always uh, rail against are not very generous. You're not going to relocate for modest uh, benefits. And we also know that in, um, state to state mobility falls with income. Moving's hard. Um, and it's really hard if you have no resources. Your social networks in Seattle, are you going to leave Seattle? No, you aren't. And so for all those reasons, um, these convenient explanations for regional variation don't don't hold up. Is there anybody ever looked at the the type of housing stock in that, um, you know, Detroit, which I'm very familiar with, uh, had a high percentage of the housing stock was single family homes and, you know, Los Angeles, more multifamily. Is, is there any um, correlation between the uh, type of housing stock available and the degree of homelessness? Not really. You know, Seattle um, is actually structured very similar to to Midwestern cities. We're 75 percent zone single family in Seattle, which is one of our huge political battles right now, because we need to densify if we're going to accommodate all the people who want to live here. Um, and and so, uh, you know, certainly New York is going to have less single family, although there are places in, in outer boroughs that are, that are heavily single family. Um, and so, no, I don't think I don't think the actual stock of housing is the, is the bigger issue. What we see is the vacancy rate, the rental market vacancy rate is far more important and, uh, you know, in a city or, or county. Um, and that's what drives it much more than just the, uh, the built environment. And, and, you know, one of the things that you uh, phrase if it's a new term to me called a policy of banishment, um, you know, that yeah, people want to live here, but they don't have the means to. So we're going to, uh, in effect, criminalize it and move them out. Um, but your, your research discovered that's not a, a solution that has any kind of stickiness to it. It no, just puts a um, problem out of sight is what if, if I took the right conclusion from your book, you, you, you're saying that it basically just moves the problem out of sight. It's a spatial fix. It's a spatial fix. So there's a great book written by two University of Washington uh, professors called Banished, if, you're, if your uh, listeners are interested in that. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the criminalization concept, I first got interested in this when I was living in New York in Manhattan in the mid-90s, and Giuliani was mayor. And Giuliani was on a push to uh, clean up Manhattan. And what did clean up Manhattan meant? It meant getting homeless people off the subways and off the streets. And so I remember riding the subway from the Upper West Side where I lived down to Wall Street to my office, and there would be people sleeping on the subway who were likely experiencing homelessness. And the police would come on the subway, you know, rip this person up out of a dead sleep and drag them off. And it was kind of hard to watch, you know, if you're a softie and like, this is, this, is a, this is a tough situation. And I remember thinking, I wonder where these people are going. It didn't end homelessness. What it did was it moved homelessness out of Manhattan such that people who lived there, people who were vacationing in Manhattan didn't confront it. And so we have a long history of, of kind of chamber of commerce motivations to end homelessness in the, in the urban core. Um, and I understand those motivations. Um, and, but, but we're fooling ourselves if that is um, ending homelessness. For example, we had the all-star game here in Seattle this summer. And as we were walking around downtown, I will say in the last five years, it hasn't looked that nice in the week leading up to the All-Star yeah. Game well, because the whole world was coming to Seattle. And, yeah. and the mayor got some flack for that because it was a very clear, and they wouldn't admit it, but it was very clear that they were clearing people out so that people who came to Seattle to enjoy the All-Star Game were not confronted with homelessness. And so it's not just New York. It's not just Giuliani. There are all sorts of cities that are doing this even, even today. Yeah, indeed. It's part of the uh, preparation for the Super Bowl is yes. to set up uh, shelters with uh, food, beverages, and big televisions and uh, with the proviso people stay off the streets. Um, do you know if anybody's gone into the like the tent cities and said, you, you know, like who's there? Why are they there? Um, uh, in recent uh, times, I've been to like Salem, Oregon, and underneath the highway overpasses are cheek to jowl tent cities. And you see it across the overpasses in um, Los Angeles. Um, 
and I'm, I said, I don't want to decide, you know, what the policy response, I want to, who's there and why are they there? Has anybody gone in there and, and talked to folks like what's bringing you here? Oh, sure. Yeah. There's been a lot of, uh, of research that, that goes into encampments or shelters to understand who is experiencing homelessness and what, what brought them there. So, um, it, for people who are interested, there's, there's plenty of books and, and journal articles on, on that topic. You know, I, I have never experienced homelessness. I've never experienced housing precarity, but I've talked to a lot of people who, who have or have in the past. And I'll say every story is unique. If you think you're going to go in there and get one consistent story, that's just not the case. Um, yeah, I wouldn't have, be, I'd, I'd expect to hear poverty and I'd expect to yeah, see absolutely. mental illness, uh, drug use. Um, I, I think I would I'd expect to see some choice as well um, that if folks said this is my best option. Um, as you know, when Silicon Valley was booming, we had people that couldn't afford to live there and they were, you know, sleeping on the buses and and that type of thing. Um, so I, I like things that like kind of at the retail level, what's going to help that person move into a better housing situation. Yeah. Um, you know, so we, as part of the point in time count every January, we actually conduct surveys and ask people about their experiences. And that's one of the things we write about in the book, which is you get all sorts of answers from people. You know, my boyfriend beat me up and I ran. I got in a fight with my roommate. She kicked me out and now I'm homeless. I drink too much. I lost my job. My car broke down. I couldn't get to work and now I'm unemployed. Um, you know, da 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 and, yeah. and so we hear all of these, what we call precipitating events that, that, that cause people to um, experience homelessness. And what we try to draw a distinction uh, between in the book is um, to honor these precipitating events because they absolutely are these people's truth. But also understanding that, um, you know, if I if my wife and I were to get divorced tonight, neither of us are going to be homeless tomorrow. So divorce in and of itself is not a cause of homelessness, um, but in the wrong set of circumstances, that absolutely can be a factor that drives someone into homelessness. And when we ask someone, why are you now living in a tent? It's like, well, I got divorced and, I, and I'm not in my house anymore. There's this broader context of precarity that we don't really think about and that people don't respond to when... Um, when responding. And so what's interesting is the Seattle Times will publish the results of these surveys. And then people will say, see, no one mentioned high housing costs. <laughs> right. Like, right. You know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, but, but think about that. Think, think about uh, the divorced person yep. uh, that says, all right, I got to find a place to, to live. Yep. All right. I, I don't have a roof over my head. My wife tells me, you know, I'm not welcome back in my own home or my former home yep. and I'm still working. I still have a job, but I can't afford the rent. Yeah. Uh, and you talk about the um, housing cost burden. And, and you know, we've had, you know, decades of, uh, you know, money printing. So inflation is hitting, has been hitting us for a long time. Um, we have much higher rates of taxation on work. Um, if you, you know, we talked about the 1980s, what the rate of social security payments were then versus today. And so that, that wage is getting pressed. Wages are down because we don't have those big manufacturing um, payrolls rolling through the economy. And we have inflation. It kind of all adds up to me that especially a person coming out of a divorce doesn't have enough cash flow to meet the rent. And therefore, their their option is I got to stay outside or I've got to go find another answer. Am I on the right track at all with that? Yeah, well, I mean, what we what we find in the book is that, you know, high concentrations of homelessness happen in places with really high rents and low vacancies. And so when life happens, you know, for some of us, life is an inconvenience for others. It has really, really significant consequences. If life happens in um, in Seattle, something unfortunate happens. The outcomes are very different than in Detroit, which is why Detroit, with the highest poverty rate in the nation, has far lower rates of homelessness than a really affluent city like Seattle because um, you're one if you're one pay- paycheck away from from trouble, it's easier to figure it out when the rents are seven hundred bucks than when rents are three thousand. Indeed, and, and, you know, and that's and, kind and, of the, the thesis of the book. And the way you, you've categorized them, I found interesting that uh, Detroit, St. Louis, Chicago, and Cleveland—they're flat to negative growth, yep. along with low per capita homelessness. Yep. Okay. Los Angeles and New York, opposite coasts, large populations, modest growth, high home homelessness. Boston, Seattle, San Francisco, the coastal boom towns, 
high population growth, low supply, high prices, high homelessness. And in contrast to that, Charlotte, San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, high growth, high supply because of a lot of building and low homelessness. And as I was working my way through your book and anticipating what you're going to say in the last chapter, I'm thinking, is he going to go and say, we need to build more housing units? I was going to ask, ask, are we going to build different kinds? Because you kind of gave a foreshadowing of density and things that might go into single family um, neighborhoods, you know, some kind of acceptable multifamily situation. So what part of, you know, how producing more housing and or creating more density goes into the solution and how might we get there as a country? Well, I think, um, first of all, one of the challenges with, with housing and real estate is it's intensely local. And so setting national housing policy is difficult because you're setting housing policy for Detroit and Seattle at the same time, which are two same country, but other than that, no, no similarities, you know, in terms of market dynamics, employment, poverty, um, built environment, population growth, et cetera, et cetera. So that's hard. And so when we think about um, what the solutions are, um, you know, is building more housing alone in Seattle going to end homelessness? No. No, we got to figure out how people can afford this housing. Just building market rate housing won't won't fix it. But I will say not building housing and allowing vacancy rates to stay at 3% and rents just keep going up and up and up will continue to exacerbate this crisis. Mm -hmm. And so one of the solutions for coastal cities is, one, we have to densify because we can't sprawl because these places have mountains and water, which, you know, inhibit our ability to, um, to sprawl like Charlotte or Austin is doing. Um, and so we're going to need to densify. It's going to be more multifamily housing and we need a lot of housing units. You know, the estimates are we need 500,000 housing units. Actually, the latest is 800,000 housing units in Puget Sound over the next 25 years. Mm. That's a massive amount of housing. And we're not going to build 800,000 units of public housing or subsidized housing. That's not going to happen. We need private developers to build, 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 build. And at the same time, we need to be thinking about for people who have lower incomes, how are they going to access some of this housing? And that's a different policy discussion. Um, and so will people say, well, I'm not convinced that's going to work. And it's like, well, it may not, but we do know that when you have adequate housing and part of the adequate housing in Detroit is the fact that you built a bunch of housing in the forties, fifties, and sixties, you lost 30% of your population and housing doesn't disappear when people leave. So what happens is you end up with higher vacancies and lower rents. And despite all the challenges that Detroit has had, they've been able to maintain a relatively low rate of homelessness. And so we do know that housing, adequate housing can help. The question is for the cities that have gotten way behind the eight ball, my city being one of them, how do you get out of that? It's really, really, really hard. And, and so it's going to take a lot. It's going to take help from the feds, from the state, from cities, from counties, um, as well as, as private action in terms of, of building housing. And so uh, I'm not optimistic that we're going to make big changes in the next couple of years, but I do know that not building housing will exacerbate a, a problem that's already pretty bad. In, in, well, look, in Detroit, it's far worse. We lost 60% inside the city limits, 60% of the population from peak yeah. to trial. Yeah. Um, and we lost housing supply because people walked away and yes. they, they've just you know knocked down. Now, the good news is they're making good use. We have a great mayor right now in Mike Duggan who is uh, making good use of the infrastructure, the roads and the sewers and the like. Sure. Uh, and all the access to water and things we have uh, here. Um so one of the things I, I was pondering, you know, gentrification, where you have a, an old impoverished neighborhood and, you, you know, maybe younger people or more entrepreneurial people say, you know, I can't afford to live in the expensive suburbs, but I can buy that home there and rehab it. And they're going to put up with all the urban ills until the neighborhood starts to turn around. It, do you have a view whether gentrification is good or not good? Um, and, and I know this may differ based on markets and, and, and the like, but any thoughts about gentrification? Well, I think that gentrification and displacement, which are related uh, concepts, is a super important part when we start to think about the development that's needed in our cities. And I think the problem with, with, display, with gentrification and associated displacement is um, it ignores many times incumbent residents. And mm -hmm. so what has happened in Seattle, for example, the central district of Seattle was the home of the black population in Seattle for generations. And as Seattle boomed, Amazon came to town, people realized like, 
hey, this is pretty convenient. You know, we're right near downtown. We're near Amazon's campus. I'm going to start living here. And so what has happened over the last 20 years is the black population in Seattle has been hollowed out and in essence has been displaced to South King County. And so these important civic institutions, churches, et cetera, that serve that population now are um, in the middle of these highly gentrified uh, neighborhoods. And so if you're a landowner and pr uh, property prices have gone up, you might say, yeah, gentrification is great. Gentrification is great. If you are a black resident of Seattle whose grandparents and parents lived in the Central District and now you're living uh, in South King County, you might say, no, this is terrible. This is terrible. I lost my home. I lost my social network, um, the culture that I was raised in. And so what I think is important when, when we start to think about changing the built environment is doing so in a way that is thoughtful, um, that allows for incumbent residents to continue to live there while also building the, the um, new housing that's desperately needed. So what we've talked about, and I've been involved in some legislative efforts out here is, for example, around transit, when we're going to build a whole bunch, ideally would build a lot of housing, dense housing near transit areas, um, is to ensure that there is a gentrification displacement strategy. Because if you just start and just build, what's going to happen is people are going to get pushed out. And I think there's an equity issue there, and there are negative consequences that, generally speaking, we've ignored until it's too late. And we say, oh, look at what just happened. And yeah. so... Um, is it, is it possible to build all the units we need without some gentrification? No, I think it's highly, highly unlikely. But can we do so in a more intelligent way such that we don't completely hollow out communities in the process? I would hope that the answer to that question is yes, with some proper planning. So, um, you know, when you talk about densification and multifamily, whether it's a you know small apartment building inside of a, 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 a formerly single family rental, um, or some of the things that some of the university towns have experienced, you know, they had uh, you know, huge single family homes that were no longer practical. Um, they got divided into flats, then they got removed for condo development. But then as the more uh, uh, higher income people came in, there's a, a, an acute lack of affordable housing. And the policy responses will make, uh, you know, it's not subsidized as it is subsidized to a degree but it is not market rents is that part of the solution here well um and just so i understand your question just is is the densification of of urban neighborhoods part of the solution is that is that am i getting that yeah, yeah indeed yeah exact and and how we get there you know if yeah. we're going to go from uh from big houses that b become flats and now they're yeah. to get more dense we're going to put in condos or rental properties sure. and and should some be set aside to, for affordability for you know, police officers, school teachers and the like. Yep. Um, is um, that a good policy response? Yeah. So I think uh, Minneapolis is uh, my hometown is a, is the nation is watching Minneapolis right now because they took the bold step of of eliminating single family zoning throughout the entire city. And so it is now illegal um, well, it used to be illegal to build multifamily housing on, on many of the parcels because it was zoned for single family. So this change in Minneapolis is important for a couple of reasons. One is it doesn't outlaw single family homes. If you live in a single family home, no one's going to take it away from you. The point is, is that if you decide to leave or redevelop your property, you can put up a three flat or a four flat. And that's what the, the law now allows. And that is a, a key tool. And so we're not building Midtown Manhattan in Minneapolis. Um, but we are allowing for far more density um, as the as the city grows and evolves over over the next couple of decades. And so I think that is a move that we're going to see. The state of Oregon has done that. California has made some of these changes. We've done it in Washington around transit. What we're going to see is a lot more action uh, of of this type. And will that face some resistance? Sure, it will because people like single family neighborhoods. But this change will happen slowly over time. While we do that, there's an important debate around how do we then ensure affordability. Part of it is adequate supply will help with affordability because we won't have these really low vacancy rates driving rents up. So just more supply alone will help. But then there do need to be some policy responses around how can we do this um, uh, to create affordability. And that's going to come down to some form of subsidy, construction subsidy, or potentially some, um, some uh, subsidy to uh, homeowners or to, uh, to renters in the form of vouchers or whatever. I think the middle is really interesting, which is, you know, third grade teachers can't afford to live in Seattle anymore. That's a problem. And I think people of all political persuasions agree that you can't have a community without police officers, without firefighters, without teachers who serve their community living there. And so there's a big push around missing middle housing in, in many cities for this very reason. Mm -hmm. And 
that hopefully we can construct without massive um, subsidy, but we just need to acknowledge the fact that people making $70,000 a year need to be able to live in the cities that they serve. And, and hopefully through um, higher density housing, um, different um, building types, we can begin to create that, that housing that's desperately needed. I lived in Houston uh, for a couple of years in the 1970s. And Houston, of course, famously has no zoning. Yes. Um, but what they did, what developers did to get around that, they had deed restrictions. Mm -hmm. okay? So, yeah. yeah, there's no zoning, but in the deed, it limited what you could do with that uh, piece of, of dirt. Um, so when we look at, at the policy response, um, I, I, I think that... Uh, you know, this is a naughty problem, as you call out in your book. It would be, uh, if it wasn't a naughty, uh, complicated problem, it'd be solved by right now, yep. now, right? right? So, um, and when you're trying to find that optimal place um, between what you describe in your writing as tensions, mm -hmm. the tensions between short-term versus longer-term thinking, between a, a public response and a private sector response, and federal versus local, um, you've, you've really, I thought done a really great job and I'm sure you've gotten, you're getting pushed back from every entrenched interest, every place. Sure. And probably like this program, you're getting criticized from the right and the left. Yep. Okay. You're just trying to solve a problem. And if you keep focused on that versus trying to think you're going to try to make people happy, you're going to be fine. But, and your, and your qualifications in the private sector, I think, um, will, will be well, well worn, but with all of that is a preamble. Can you take us through the what you're looking at as a policy response? You know, if you were the czar of housing in the United States of America, what would you recommend? Or if the president called you today and said, you know, Professor Colburn, come and tell me what we need to do, what advice would you give them? Sure. Well, it's, um, you're exactly right. So I, you know, it's, um, it's funny. I've given this talk. I just gave my 80th book talk. Um, I gave one in New York and one in Minnesota last week. And, um, what I joke is I've been accused of being a, a shill for corporate interest and being a socialist in the same talk. Um, we're, we're, fe we're fellow travelers. I get that on the same episode sometimes. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so that's, um, that's kind of entertaining and, and, you know, and I'm, and I'm accused of being a socialist because I believe there's a public, um, role in, in dealing with this crisis. And I'm accused of being a corporate shill because I'm saying that private market needs to build a whole bunch more housing and we need to make it easier for them to do so. And I believe that both of those are true. And I don't think that either of those positions makes me either a socialist or a shill for corporate interest, but, but that's a topic for a different discussion. Um, you know, in terms of, of policy response, um, I'm going to just touch on the tensions for a moment and then get back to the bigger picture of what do we do. The challenge, if you're the mayor of Seattle right now, is Rome is burning. And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the voters are saying, I am sick and tired of having this person urinate outside of my restaurant and get these people out of here. And the problem for the mayor is this is, you know, this is an issue that has, you know, is 30, 40 years in the making. Um, and I now have to figure this out in four years. It's impossible. It is impossible. And so one of the tensions is, well, maybe I do the Giuliani thing, which is just sweet people, get them out of the city and make people feel better. And it's not changing homelessness. It's just relocating it. The other problem is standing up and say, we know that building housing will, will fix this. Building affordable housing will end this, but that's going to take 10 years. Well, you need to figure it out in the next three years because that's when the next election is. And so we have this, this huge tension. Then we say, well, should the public be building housing or private? The answer is both. Um, and, and then this really challenging issue of, is this a DC problem or is this a state of Washington or a Seattle problem? And the answer is it's all the above. And so if I were, and I've met with, I recently met with Governor Jay Inslee here in Washington, and we had this very discussion of what, what should we do? Um, I think the, the answer to the question is different depending on the um, level of government. If I were meeting with um, the White House, at the federal level, what I would say is we need to understand that the federal government has, in essence, not provided sufficient support for poor people over the last 40 years. One in four people who are eligible for housing support get it from the feds. The other three out of four are going to the state of Michigan or the state of Washington or their city saying, I need help. Housing is really expensive and I can't afford it. We have a system in the United States, for better or worse, that produces 13, 14% poverty and we help about four or five percent of households with housing the others are are just stuck and so the outcomes we see right now it's math it's math 
And, and, um, and if we don't change that, it's, it's, it's not going to deviate. And so my suggestion and my suggestions, I, I, I need to, um, state that I'm a pragmatist. So is this the ideal strategy if I had a clean slate? No, but I'm also a pragmatist. I think the most pragmatic possible solution at the federal level is to expand the voucher program. Right now, one in four people get it. If all four of those people got it, it would have, it would provide a lot more purchasing power for low-income households to allow so, them access Section 8 housing. rental vouchers? Section 8. It's now called the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Yep, the former Section 8 program. Okay. That would be uh, a policy recommendation. Why that's helpful is once you give the purchasing power, and D.C. has way more money than any state or local government, and even an expansion of the voucher program, while significant, is still, frankly, not that huge in, 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 um, with respect to the overall federal budget. What that helps with is if you're in the state of uh, Michigan or state of Washington is then the states and localities can say, we now have people with purchasing power. How do we make sure we have adequate housing in which they can use that? And so what I would say to governors and, and to mayors is we need to make sure that we have a regulatory framework that allows for the construction of housing and adequate housing. And if people continue to move to the state of Washington, that we have housing that people can use. And then for people who are low income, they have purchasing power through these vouchers. The problem, if you're the governor or the mayor, is if... DC is not acting and they haven't acted over the last 30 years. And we aren't going to right now, even on this more modest proposal of voucher expansion. What do you do now? People don't have purchasing power and we don't have housing. And that's why this is so hard. And, and so do I, do states need to invest in this? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, and so whatever you can do to make housing more affordable or get money in people's pockets such that they can afford housing to me is a positive step. And is that hard? Absolutely it is. And I'm not pretending that it, that it isn't. Mm -hmm. I will say the one thing that's really interesting is, is that we in the United States think of housing as a private good. Transit, for example, is a public good. And so when we think about the investments we've made in transit, in our region, we just made a $55 billion investment in public transit. And was it a fight? Sure, it was a fight, but ultimately we desperately needed it. From, from, um, Everett, where, where Boeing planes are made all the way down to Olympia and Tacoma, we're going to have light rail. And so you could live up there, work at Amazon, take the light rail down to Seattle, and it will hopefully spread out some of this demand throughout the region. $55 billion. The recent proposal from the governor in Washington was for $4 billion for housing. And what's interesting about that is that was kind of a shoot the moon number that didn't go anywhere. But in comparison to our investments in transit, it pales in comparison. It's not even one-tenth. It's not even one tenth. And so this you know, private notion of housing really constrains our imagination in terms of overall investments. And, um, and I think that's a challenge, especially in places that have the deficit of housing, especially affordable housing like we have in, in our state. And so um, I wish I had a better policy response that was easier, but the point is, is that this is complicated. And I think the last thing I wanna say is at the federal level, we have um, made food an important part of our safety net. If you are poor and eligible for food stamps, which is now called SNAP, you get it. Four out of four. Housing, it's one in four. And so we have drawn a distinction between food and housing in terms of, of supports to low-income households, and we're, we're living with the consequences of that decision now. <laughs> Excuse me. So what I, um, I understand then that you're talking about the supply side. So I have a regulatory framework where more housing units can be built. And you know perhaps uh, incentives to build them. Uh, let's create um, multifamily. Uh, so now we have more units available um, instead of this plot of land being for one family, it could be for four. So you're raising supply, and of course, if you raise supply, you know classic economics says that uh, uh, prices should fall. And also on the demand side, making sure that um, the parts of our population that need that support. Um, has it uh, through housing vouchers. Now, if my understanding is correct, the housing vouchers would only be for rental. And what if, you know, someone that is in that situation, they qualify today for a housing voucher, do they give up an aspiration of home ownership? You know, with all the equity and wealth building and such that goes along with that, is it a is there an exit way out of that subsidy or is it just a condition for a certain part of the population? Well, I think that's an income question. Um, is there an exit ramp? For sure. There are plenty of people who, um, in essence, kind of 
age out of, of rental subsidies because their income becomes too high. And then they, they move on and, and rent in the private market on their own or, or could become homeowners. And so I don't think in any way that um, prevents someone from accessing home ownership. I think the question is, is and, and this is true for unsubsidized households as well, which is, can you save enough money for a down payment and can you get a mortgage? And, and all those questions are then become the gating um, factors in terms of being able to access home ownership. And so, no, it's not a permanent state. Will for some people it be a permanent state? Probably. Probably because they just may not have whatever is needed to uh, earn income high enough to access housing in the private market, especially in a place that's that's pretty expensive. Um, and so I, I think the answer to the, your question is it kind of depends on, on the person and the situation, um, but it doesn't, and it was never meant to be a, a permanent subsidy. The, the goal was to give people assistance when they need it, and, and hopefully they then can continue to to work and, and, and generate higher levels of income and be able to afford housing. And, and I think that's certainly true. Um, in more affordable places. I think the challenge is, is if you're trying to get to 2,500 bucks a month in Seattle, you need a pretty darn good income. You know, a, a good chunk of our homeless population in Seattle is employed and we have an $18 minimum wage. And so there are people making 18 bucks serving coffee at, at Starbucks who are living in their cars. And, yeah, and well, the cost of transportation, the, the taxation yeah. on that $18, um, the uh, you know, young people today are paying uh, 2.9% in Medicare. When you and I were that age, we weren't paying that at all. So the, that that top line wage is, is really a mirage. Um, they're really not getting that because what really trickles into spending. And frankly, uh, you know, we had a, a phone on our wall for uh, four bucks a month and uh, you bought a television and you got all your entertainment. You didn't have to buy a streaming service or a you know, cell phone or, um, uh, you, you know, a, a cell phone service or, or an internet service, which are all, you know, those are essential services today to participate in, in the society. And and one of the things that, that as I read your book and I listened to you speak today, and, and it's a theme that we're developing on the common bridge that the, the policy solutions go beyond economics. They go beyond politics. Um, a lot of, of the greatness in this country was built because people had a heart. They had a soul that's what's the right thing to do versus I've bought into a particular ideology, either on the right or on the left. Um, you, you know, I've been an entrepreneur and I, I know that the innovation and things that come in the uh, free market are things that we're the envy of the world. Any, all the inventions that we've made yet, it can't be the answer for everything. And, and I've always said that one of the formulas for success, it's, it's talent times effort plus luck. And, you know, not having luck or having the wrong kind of luck can wipe out all the talent and effort doesn't matter. Um, you, you get a break, you know, medical condition, um, you know, a loved one falls ill, whatever. It, it, there's many things that can happen. You get in a car wreck that wasn't your fault. Lots of different things that can happen. Um, so I think we need to get back to this when we're, we, you know, what do we want to be as a society? Um, do we want to make sure that everyone's cared for and can we walk past our fellow human beings and saying, well, I'm doing okay. I guess it's your problem. It must've been something you did. It's your mental illness. It's your addiction. It's your, uh, inability to get marketable skills. Um, I just don't think that's the kind of society we need to be. We need, we need to um, provide better answers. And, and also, we had a recent guest, Zoe Kennedy, um, who is in a program they're looking to reduce violence in, and in the urban core. And the funding comes from Washington, but the work's done locally mm -hmm. because they, they couldn't do the work one size fits all from Washington, D.C., and you couldn't possibly get the money together locally. And I have high hopes because they're, they're starting with where's our heart and what can we do to make this a better society? And, and I think you're heading in that direction too. Um, I, I hope that the book's been a great success. Um, and, and I hope that uh, um, I, I will give Joe Biden a call this afternoon and tell him he needs to uh, have <laughs> you in his office. Wait a minute. I don't have his number. You're going to have to go through someone else for that. That's right. Um, Greg, this has been a, 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 a great conversation. Um, are there any other possible approaches that you looked at? Uh, 
you know, again, I think you're pretty well balanced on public private. It all makes sense. Um, any change is going to, to be uncomfortable some, for some people that change is being imposed on. But any other approaches that you looked at and think might work or that you you discarded? Well, I, I would say that um, one of the cautions I have for West Coast cities is um, the temptation to construct massive shelter systems and get people off the streets. I think there's absolutely a role for shelter. Uh, but I was just in New York City last week, and 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 the, the the warning for LA, San Francisco, and Seattle is New York has has warehoused people in shelters for for now thirty years, and you know they'll spend 10, 15 years in shelter with with no exit, and that shelter system consumes billions of dollars a year, and so if we build shelter without figuring out how to get people out of that system, keep this flow of people, uh, I think we might regret that, and so that's that's one thing where. Um, it's a warning I would give to, to West Coast cities who are who are facing this right now. That's fine. Build more shelter capacity, but we got to remember how we're going to get people out, and that 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 means housing. And so, like all knotty issues, it's it, there's not an easy silver bullet here. It's I always joke that as a professor, the answer is D, all of the above. We need a little <laughs> bit of a lot of these things. We need market rate housing. We need affordable. We need subsidized housing. We need short term solutions. We need long term solutions. And if you only focus on one of them, it will undermine our ability to. To fix this, and and I think you know, in just as kind of a parting shot here, the purpose of the book is really to say, let's stop focusing on Joe on the street. And when we walk by Joe, saying, "Well, Joe made some poor decisions, therefore I can go about my day feeling good about myself," instead seeing that Joe's experience is um, is is the result of structure, of structure that we all play a role in. And once we recognize that, then we can look in the mirror and say, "Then what is I, Greg Colburn, going to do about this?" and Part of that is, is, you know, if someone's going to try to put up a multifamily housing unit in my development and I show up and say, no, I'm contributing to the problem in a small way. And if we, you know, and so just these small changes that we can all make can have a ripple effect. And that's, that's, that's my hope anyway, but it's a, it's a big ask. Well, I, and I, I like the way you've uh, framed it in your book, talking about inflow, crisis yeah. response and outflow. Um, and, and it gets right down the center of the mission of the common bridge that we have solvable problems if we can have discussions um, as we come to our close today is there anything that we didn't cover is there any question i should have asked that i didn't well i think um the, the way that i conclude a lot of my talks rich and I, and I think this is important is for your listeners who are saying i'm not convinced that housing is going to fix this and that's a fair concern um the, the point that when people say, how do you know that housing is going to help Joe who's a mess on the street? And the answer to that question is because we've done it. U.S. government leaders of both political parties decided they didn't want veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan to experience homelessness like the Vietnam generation did. And what did they do? They prioritized funding and resources to ensure that that wouldn't happen. And what happened? We cut veteran homelessness by 50% in 10 years, which is a statistic that is not appreciated enough. And this is a population with addiction and, and post-traumatic stress and all sorts of behavioral health challenges. And we got people out of homelessness. And how did we do it? We gave them housing. In some cases, it was giving Rich a voucher because all you needed was a little support and you were off to the races. In some cases, maybe it's Greg who has an addiction issue and you gave me housing and supports to deal with my addiction issue. And so the question really isn't, do these interventions that we debate work? They work. We've demonstrated that they work. The question is, will we expand those interventions to a broader population of people, which to date, the answer has been no, we're not going to. And we're seeing the consequences. So we know it works. The question is, do we have the political will, resource allocation, dollars to, to do that? And to date, we've said no. And for my readers, listeners, and viewers that are um, recoiling at the notion of people being given things like housing support or addiction support, Absent that, they end up either uh, committing crimes or they end up for sure in the healthcare system where it's far more expensive and drains very scarce resources. And frankly, it just cycles through um, a longer topic for a different day. And we'll be talking about that during this season five on the Common Bridge. Um, Professor Colburn, you've been very generous with your time. Any closing a statement for the common bridge? Well, no, just thank you for having me. And I think your last point is really, really important. What I say to people when they say, Greg, these housing interventions are expensive. I'll say, you know what? You're right. You know what else is expensive? Untreated homelessness. And we're paying for that already. It's just distributed through all these systems, healthcare, criminal justice, streets and sanitation, et cetera. So 
Um, we're paying for it one way or another. I would prefer to pay for it and actually get people in, in, in housing and let them live a, a productive, happy life. And we're just not doing that right now, unfortunately. So thanks so much for having me. And I wish you well. Thank you so much for being on this. We've been talking to Professor Greg Colburn with his book, Homelessness is a Housing Problem. Uh, pick it up wherever you like to buy books. Uh, it's on Audible as well. Um, I believe it's Audible that you're on. Yep. And, and so uh, get involved, talk to your legislatures, um, focus on policy, not the politics. And with our guest, Greg Colburn, this is your host, Rich Helpy, signing off on The Common Bridge. Thanks for joining us on The Common Bridge. Subscribe to The Common Bridge on Substack.com or use their Substack app where you can find more interviews, columns, videos, and nonpartisan discussions of the day. Just search for The Common Bridge. You can also find The Common Bridge on Mission Control Radio or your Radio Garden app.